Welcome to Hacking Bar Games, Part 1. This is a multi-part series where we will take a embedded game device, a touchscreen game device, a very popular one from uh, days past, um, and we will hack it to bypass the security key, the physical security key, so that you can play this game when your security key goes bad. We'll explain a little more of that later. But um, before we do that, little disclaimer. There will be uh, celebrity voices and, and images impersonated badly. So uh, let's get to it. So what are we going to do today? So we're going to defeat the security key dongle on the Merit Megatouch Force 2011. What is a Megatouch? A Megatouch is a very popular bar top game that existed somewhere in the mid 90s and um, went on until about 2015. Uh, it was all in all the bars, all the rage when I was in college, after college, and um, I enjoyed playing them very much. So I bought a couple of them. And um, I, I love it. Unfortunately, the, the, the touch screens uh, were once a novelty. And it was very cool to play. Um, now that everyone has touchscreen phones and iPads, I guess people don't care about them anymore. So um, the company went out of business in 2015, I want to say. Or they, they killed support, at least, in 2015. I think they um, maybe went out of business before that. But you can't buy their products anymore. You can't get support for their products. Um, so it's basically abandoned wear. Um, but it was fun, and I still enjoy it, and a lot of people out there enjoy it. Uh, playing the games we rightfully own. We, we, we have bought them. But the question is, why do we want to hack it? Um, very simply, as I mentioned, and you'll see in this presentation, it has a physical key. Kind of looks like a watch battery. And to, to play your game that you own and purchase, you have to have this key. Um, and the key must work as well. The key itself has to work. And there's, a, there's an I.O. board, which is really like a security dongle that is the actual main component of the board. The key just has data that the, the board reads. Um, and if it breaks, you're out of luck. What's worse uh, is that these keys, you have to have the data that's on the key to play um, your game. And when these keys, they, they have a battery in there that holds it. It's, the data is actually encrypted. And when the battery goes bad, um, and the company that makes the battery is called Maxim Dallas. Um, they, they, their, their parts spec sheets um, say the lifetime of the, the um, key the battery is 10 years. So if you have, say, a Mega Touch from 2005, your battery is already over it, its due date for um, dying. When the battery dies, the data on the key is no longer accessible, and you can't play your game that you own. So, um, that's why we're going to hack it. And there's all kinds of legal crap involved. Um, but here's where, why we have the permission, or we don't have, why we can hack it. There's something called the, Di the Li Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And they have exception. And basically, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act says you can't bypass um, copy protection stuff. Well, this isn't ex exactly copy protection, it's using your own software. But, um, you know, you can't bypass these things. However, they have exceptions, um, and one of the exceptions um, that, has, that is in there is, and you can see that on the website, if you go to this website, www.copyright.gov, 1201-2010, there's an exception number five that says if you are doing this, um, hacking something to bypass um, programs protected by dongles that prevent access due to malfunction or damage and which are obsolete. Um, a dongle shall be considered obsolete if it's no longer manufactured or replacement or repair is no longer reasonable, legally available in the commercial marketplace. Um, this company's out of business. They've killed their support. There is another company that owns their rights, um, but I've contacted that company um, because I have actually some uh, keys that are bad and some I.O. boards that are bad, <clears throat> and they have told me they cannot fix the I.O. boards. Um, they don't sell replacement parts, and they don't sell new keys. They do have a later model <clears throat> called the Ion 2014 that they still have keys for so I'm not going to release any information on that <clears throat> although I don't know that they actually also support the dongle still 
Um, if the dongle or the the I/O board breaks, then your key is useless also. So, um, but I'm I'm not I'm not going near that. I'm not going near the IN2014 because they still have it. If they still support it and will sell it, um, there's still an alternative for you to get it. So I'm not I'm not touching that. Um, <clears throat> But we'll we will actually bypass the protection on the Mega Touch 2011, which is no longer supported. Okay. So what is a Mega Touch? Well, um, the one I have, I have a few of these actually. They're, they're really they're I love them. They're they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, is it's a basically a Pentium, an old Pentium. I think it's a Pentium three or four. I don't remember. I think it might be a four. Uh, Celeron. Pretty sure it's a Pentium 4 Celeron because the Pentium 3s had weird packages uh, for their CPUs. Um, running Linux 2.4. Um, it's a micro ATX form factor motherboard. It's got a touch screen. Um, and again, I mentioned it has this proprietary USB B based I.O. board and requires this key, the security key, to work. Um, but this is what it looks like. This is mine. Um, and I actually have a legal key for 2011, um, obviously. Um, but I want to, in case it breaks, I want to be able to, to play it when it breaks. Um, so I've developed this hack, and I'm going to talk about this hack. Okay, this is what the motherboard looks like. There, there's actually a few motherboards, I believe. This one's bad. Um, that's why it's labeled bad. Um, I think I threw it away, actually, this motherboard. It was one of my spare parts because, it, again, it was bad. and uh, I really don't fix PC motherboards. Maybe I should have. I don't know if there's any components that I... Uh, not too. I, I fix electronics, um, normal, old 80s electronics. I don't really. I'm not too familiar with modern electronics, um, PCs, and their ability, parts availability, besides just you know as a whole component, like buy a whole new motherboard, buying a whole new cigarette RAM. So that's the motherboard. This is the I/O board. This is actually a little simpler. Um, uses fairly standard components. Um, this I actually I believe you could fix if it breaks. Maybe there's there's one chip on here that has some EEPROM, um, or at least some NVRAM that can be stored on a uh, Cypress USB chip. Um, I don't know if they actually stored data on it or not. Um, if not, then without that code, I don't know that you could fix it if that chip uh, but died, but whatever. Uh, this one's also bad. Um, this is my one of my bad boards, and I cannot get it fixed by uh, the company that owns the rights to Merit anymore. They don't support it. Okay, and that's where the security key goes, as you can see, right here. Okay, this is what the security key looks like. Um, it's a little, looks like a watch battery. It's not a battery. There is a battery inside of it. So if you try to measure it for voltage, you won't see anything because it's it itself is not a battery. It is a, uh, it, it's a uh, data storage device. Okay, and it comes in that little key holder that you see. So this is what happens when your your game is valid and you have a valid key. Okay, and this is my game booted with the, the, the 2011 key in it. Works fine. This is a game if you don't have a security key in it. This is what you see. If you put a invalid key in it, that, that is, um, these Dallas keys are not just uh, for the, this Mega Touch game. They are things you can buy. They're using security systems, um, ID systems, temperature gauges. It's, it's, it's weird. Um, so you can actually go buy a new part, um, but unless you have the right data on the part, and it, if the part is actually has a serial number, if it's the serial number is not in a certain range, you'll get a message um, like this, for example, invalid key. Okay, so let's get to work on hacking this. So here's my outline. This is the steps I'm going to take to hack the system. Uh, first thing I need to do, as I mentioned, it's running Linux. I need to get root on the system so I can do stuff. Do commands, um, you know, command prompt basically. Once I do that, I have to figure out how the game itself starts up and obtain the game binaries and figure out how they use this key um, to make sure that you have a valid key. And then we have to reverse engineer and patch the binary to defeat the security key. And um, it, it found all kinds of interesting weirdnesses as I went through this, so I, hopefully this will be a fun talk. Okay. So, step one, get root on the shell. I'm sorry, get a root shell on the system. So, how do we do this? Well, number one, it's running Linux, so this is going to be easy. Um, I basically cheated. Well, not cheated. Um, one rule of, of hacking things or security in general 
computer security, network security, is if you have physical access to something, you win. The game is over, basically. There's all kinds of weird up-and-coming stuff um, with um, trusted hardware, uh, TPM modules and things like that, that um, store encryption keys and encrypt data. Um, but basically, um, they're, they're not horribly used widespread yet. They, they exist, but I don't think many places use actually use them to their their full capacity. Um, basically, the rule is if you can physically get access to something, you're going to win. Um, you're going to be able to to get access to the machine. So what I did is I removed the hard drive from the system. It's an old um, P parallel ATA hard drive, the ones with those big 40-pin ribbon cables. Um, put an adapter on it, a SATA adapter, and plugged it um, into my desktop where I was running a uh, virtual machine. Uh, mounted it. I was running Ubuntu, in this case 1404. Um, attached it as a physical drive and just booted up and uh, started reading the data off the machine. But I, I don't want to deal with it on my virtual machine. I just want to get into the system um, so that I can put a keyboard and a mouse on the actual Mega Touch, which you can do. The back of the Mega Touch itself um, has a USB port. So you can get a USB hub, plug your mouse and your keyboard in, and go. Okay, actually, I don't even use a, key a mouse. I just used a keyboard. But So I took it out, um, put it in my Linux desktop, and uh, looked at the partition table. I did a DF minus uh, H, and this is, we see, a, you know, a bit fairly standard Linux partition scheme. Okay, You see that the root file system is dev HDA5. Okay, so it shows up as dev HDA5, and um, when it's in the actual, um, shows up that as dev HDA5 when it's in the actual Mega Touch unit. If you put it on a SATA adapter, it's going to show up as dev SD something, um, SDB or SDC5. Uh, um, but when it's on actually Mega Touch, it's dev HDA5. So I was just going to go ahead and change the password and then put it back in the system so I could log in when I noticed something interesting. So in Unix, um, Etsy password is the file that stores the user accounts. And there's a, f a file called Etsy shadow that also has the passwords. Um, but in Unix, there's a special account called root, which has a UID of zero and oops and a, a GID of zero. And this is the super user account. This is the system administrator account. If you have the password to this, you can do whatever you want. Um, Unix has an interesting trait that is you can actually have multiple accounts with different names, different passwords. If they have the same UID, they are all the same account, basically. So I noticed this account, Max, which has a UID of zero and a GID of zero. That means Max account is also root. It's also the administrator account. So um, I was just going to change the password for root. But I saw this, and that intrigued me. I'm, I'm like, oh, I wonder why they made this this Max account. So um, just for fun, I got a program called John the Ripper, which cracks passwords. And I loaded um, up the password file. I copied it to temp a pass. Um, so I copied Etsy Shadow to temp a pass. And I ran John the Ripper on temp a pass. And it guessed the password for the Max account in the first guess. The password is Max. So. That's great. I don't even have to alter the system. I can just put the hard drive right back in and uh, log in as Max. Well, I didn't put the hard drive back in exactly yet, but um, I know now that I can log in with the username Max and a password of Max. All right. And I'll have full administrator access to the system. So um, one thing I wanted to do, though, is when you boot the game up, it immediately boots up. It doesn't give you a login prompt. It immediately boots up into the, um, the game. Well, not immediately. It takes like three minutes. It's pretty slow. Um, but so I want to get a shell. I want to be able to type stuff in and examine the system. So a couple of things you need to know. Unix, um, at least this version of Unix, um, most versions of Unix up until a certain date, and some of them still do, I think, use what's called System 5 init. Um, and the main configuration tab in System 5 init is called Etsy init tab. And this is um, how you tell the system what you want it to do. And what happens with the init tab, it reads these entries. And ultimately, it usually um, 
spawns off a script called etsy rc.drc, which then goes and reads through a bunch of other directories, all right, crc.drcx, where x is a number dot d, and runs just a bunch of scripts in, in those directories. Um, so that's how normal Unix starts. But I wanted to uh, make sure that I actually could get a shell. So what I did is I um, added these these lines. Actually, one of them was already there. I, I made a couple of them because I want to get multiple virtual terminals. And then I um, edited out the line that actually um, starts the graphics mode so that I could actually get into the system and do stuff, um, which is also an Etsy in a tab. Okay. So then I put the hard back in, rebooted the unit, boom does not boot up into the, the game, it actually gives me a shell where I can log in with the username and password of Max. Much better. I just got shell. All right. So that was easy. Uh, get root shell on the system was super simple. Find out how the game starts up and obtain the game binaries it was a little more difficult, not horribly difficult. Um, it was interesting because they do a whole bunch of weird... <sighs> they do go through a lot of effort to try to hide the game binary from you. It's actually not just a normal... It's not a normal file on the system that you run, like a normal um, computer program. Um, it, it's hidden within another program that unpacks it, and they go through all this effort to make sure you... you to make it hard for you to find out what it's doing and to find it but it's so trivially bypassed that it's, it's, it's actually funny. So um, let's go about doing that. So system five in it, I mentioned. Um, so we look in the Etsy in a tab, find out how the game starts. And this line is what begins the graphical login, which ultimately launches the game. So, um, and I commented this out actually, um, when I did the password or when I, um, when I put the hard drive in, um, before putting it back in my system, my Megatouch, I commented this line out because otherwise it would actually launch the game. But we still don't know. This user has been auto logged and actually is not the game. It just starts a, a series of steps that actually launch the game. Okay. So um, what this is saying is at run level 5, which on Linux is graphical long run level, keep respawning this program. If it dies, user has been auto login. So what do we do? Let's go look at user has been auto login. So um, first thing I like to do is I just type strings, which is an, a neat Unix utility that um, looks for ASCII strings in a binary. So I did strings on it, and it's, there's not much there. In fact, um, this isn't even a binary program. I think this was a text file, a, um, a shell script, if I remember correctly. Um, but you see, this is basically what strings has given me, not much. Um, it says, error, this program needs to change user IDs, therefore must be run at root. It's got a reference to Etsy sysconfig auto login, a couple error messages, user um, error couldn't stat Etsy sysconfig auto, auto login, error couldn't open Etsy sysconfig auto login, error required variable user not found in Etsy sysconfig log, um, auto login, then user x11r6 bin startx, an error note such user, um, and this is a printf um, format string. So um, we see here, Etsy sysconfig auto login. It seems to care about this. Um, and this looks, this is, if you know anything about Red Hat Linux, this is um, a directory where system configuration files are stored. Usually um, they're just settings. And sure enough, if you look in there, um, Etsy sysconfig auto login, there is a user variable and it's set to max. Okay. Um, if you also know anything about Unix, uh, you know if you, if you don't have a graphical display automatically start if you if you let's say you're on a server or a desktop and it doesn't start graphics you can usually start graphics by typing start x which launches the graphical a series again of steps so i'm pretty sure this program is just going to look for the user in uh variable and that's config login auto login change their uid or their their the identity of the current running user to max or whoever is in user and then run user x 11 bin start x to start the graphics screen, which is exactly what it does. Okay, but let's look at user um, x11, or I'm sorry, user x11 um, 
R6 bin start X is going to read a file in your home directory called X init RC. That's just the way it works. X init RC is um, X init run commands, I believe what RC always stands for. Unix configuration files generally have a um, an ending of RC for initialization files. Basically, though, <clears throat> this does a bunch of non-important things. The important thing is it eventually runs this program, user local bin start, and then it redirects um, errors and output to var merit log. That's what that's just a shell command to do that. So user local bin start is the next place I want to look. And user local bin start immediately caught my attention because it's a number one, a huge file. It's ginormous. Um, well, for a binary, four megs, unless you're like talking about Firefox or Chrome, is pretty big. Um, and strings, again, I, I talked about that I like to run strings on things. Um, first thing I do, because it just gives me a lot of quick information. There's almost no output with strings. And any real program is going to have a lot of output, especially the programs for megabytes. So this is more or less all the output of strings. There's a few things I just left off because they were, were important. There's some shared libraries, and there's some calls, um, some libc calls, and some error messages. Okay, And that's about it. There's one more important message we're going to see, which is kind of funny. But you see this call open write, which opens a file, which writes to a file, unlink, which deletes a file, ptrace, which was really interesting when this popped up, like, what is ptrace doing in here? ptrace allows you to debug another process. And it's very interesting how they use ptrace in here. And then exec v, which allows you to start another process. In fact, it, it not only allows you to start another process, it replaces the current process with a whole other program. Um, so there wasn't very many things, but this, the exec v and the ptrace really caught my eye because that's kind of weird. Um, and of course, um, this really caught my eye, the, the best string ever. What is a pirate looking for, even though it's always right behind him? Um, when I saw this, I'm like, okay, I got to look at this file in more depth because they're just teasing me at this point. Um, what's a pirate always looking for, even though it's always right behind him? Anyone know? Is it chicken pot pies? No, kitty. It's not chicken pot pie. It's his booty. His booty is always right behind him, and he's always looking for it. Oh, Cartman. So uh, that was interesting, and I'm like, okay, i gotta got to look at this binary. So <clears throat> I use a program called IDAPRO, which I have a license for, a paid license for. Um, Ida Pro is an amazing program. It is a disassembler, which means it takes machine code and it turns into an assembly language code, which assembly language code is like machine code, it's just more human readable. Um, and it analyzes the program and it's amazing and I love Ida Pro. Um, but it was very interesting, again, because I had this huge 4 meg file which should have thousands of what's called functions, it only had the main function, the main program, which was tiny, and small, six, I think it was six other small functions. And out of the four megabytes, that's really weird to have seven functions, all of them tiny. I mean, that's just was weird, okay? So I knew something was fishy. It's a huge file, almost no strings, um, weird text and strings like the, the challenge, and Ida found almost zero code. Just so it's a ginormous file with a few, just a little bit of actual executable code and a whole bunch of who knows what. Um, that's not anything. It's not code, or at least Ida can't find it. Doesn't can't determine it to be code. So, um, spoil alert. It ends up that user local bin start is, is not really the game binary. It's like a wrapper program that actually unpacks the real game binary, decrypts it, and extracts it to a file called temp dstart, which it then starts up later. 
Um, and it's really interesting because the real game binary is actually part of the user local bin start program. It's that whole four megabytes is the actual game binary, but it's actually encrypted and it just stored as data effectively. So this little program is going to actually decrypt it um, or extract the data, decrypt it, and then write it to a file and then start it off. Um, and it was really neat because user local bin start had some odd techniques. They were, they were pretty naive or pretty basic, um, but it was clear they're trying to stop people from reading the game code. So how did they try to hide the game code? Well, the first thing is they had obfuscated, I can't say that word, strings. Um, in, a, in a normal program, you're going to have you're going to have data um, like paths to files and things like that. And all the important strings in here, besides the, the few that we saw the system calls and all that, um, and a few error messages were, were basically um, kind of hidden or obfuscated. Um, I, and I said it wrong. I can never say that word right. It's like phenomenon. How did I say it right? I can't say phenomenon, phenomenon either. Anyway. Um, so what they did here is rather than actually write a string like a normal person does and they type it in in, in a program, they took the, the characters from a string, individually moved the characters into memory, contiguous memory, um, and then later on each of these characters were, were one off from their ASCII value. And if you looked at some of my other series on, on hacking arcade ROMs, you would probably know what an ASCII value is if, you, if you're not familiar with that. But um, ASCII value is just how a computer represents um, um, text, the English language, or the English character set, the Latin character set in um, computer is, an, is a number. So each ASCII value was also off by exactly one value. Um, and later on, there would have a loop that adds, that would take the, move all the data, the, the string characters to a, a, another location, and then they would add one to each. Um, and the importance of fusciated strings are proc self exe, which is interesting, because um, in Linux, proc self exe is actually, uh, if you read it, it actually is the binary that is currently running. It's, it's an image of the binary that's currently running. And temp dstart, which is that program that I told you that it would eventually write, the, it would unpack and write to. Okay. Here's an example of the obfuscated string temp dstart. You can see they move each character into uh, the stack. Um, don't worry if you don't know what the stack is. They're moving one character at a time. And then each of these characters, except for the last one, zero, is actually off by one um, value. 2EH, hexadecimal 2EH, um, is the character right before the slash. I think it's a I'm going to say it's a percentage symbol. I don't remember. Um, 73H is actually S, so which is one less than T. 6C uh, in hex is L, L M, yeah, which is one less than M. And uh, 64, um, sorry, 6F is one less than P, B, C, D, F, G, H, P, L, and O, which is O, I believe. Um, so they're, they're, they're actually putting, they're not putting temp D start in memory. They're putting one character less, okay? And then you can see here's a loop where they go through, um, where they store the memory, and they just add one byte to, um, I'm sorry, not one byte, one, one value. They increment the value by one. So this turns into... Um, slash T M P slash D S T A R T or temp D start. So that was interesting because okay, so they 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 made it so you didn't obviously when we did strings we didn't see those 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 values um, because the way they they hid them um, they they didn't they weren't contiguous in memory and strings looks for ASCII values that are contiguous. They weren't contiguous until the program runs, and then they're contiguous, and then they're one off. So they, they clearly were trying to hide this path from you, but no disrespect to the developers, that was pretty lame. Um, but then again, hopefully the developers were working on the awesome game code, because the games are awesome, and not worrying about trying to protect this, um, because if they did, they were wasting their time. That was pretty simple.
Okay, so we got the temp d star as a path, um, and we also got this other string proxy self exe. <clears throat> so there was other attempts, and this one I actually liked um, to hide the game code. Um, one of the things you do, you might do if you're trying to analyze software, doing some types of forensics or reverse engineering, is you might run the program in a debugger. And um, a debugger lets you actually attach to a running program, stop it, and analyze memory. So, of course, that's the first thing I tried to do. Um, but what's interesting is it's got some anti-analysis um, code in there. The first thing it does is it actually debugs itself. And <clears throat> this stops you from debugging it externally. Because if you debug it externally, if you start it, well, actually, it doesn't stop you from debugging externally. If you start it externally debugged, when the code actually goes to do this, when so it tries to debug itself, it fails and it goes down an entirely different path and basically exits. Okay, um, I think it did some other things to try to make it seem, to try to confuse you, but basically, if it can't p-trace itself, it uh, fails out. So, um, which is neat. Um, so you, so even though you might be in with a debugger, you'll never see the actual real code that does the the magic okay so that was cool i enjoyed that that was fun um much better attempt guys um at the um anti-protection that was uh, a lot better than the poorly um hidden strings but also credit for this this was actually kind of uh kind of neat i've i've seen people do that before um but maybe that's why i was looking for that but it, it stands out pretty obviously but anyway um great games guys um don't mean to disrespect you if you're a developer. I love your games. Um, anyway, um, so once once it successfully can debug itself, what it does is it forks off some other pro, um, copies of itself, but ultimately it reaches in. It goes to that proc self exe um, and extracts, starts reading data from its own binary. Um, <clears throat> It extracts the data, decrypts the data, writes it to a file called temp dstart, and then um, one process, because I said it forks itself into multiple copies, runs temp dstart, which is the actual game, and then the other child process deletes temp dstart. Okay? So what it's doing is it's extracting it, but then it's deleting it so um, you can't read it because it's not on the file system anymore. Except, um, well, we'll talk about that. Um, so, neat trick doesn't work very well in Linux, though. Um, so, again, it's going back into itself via proc self exe. It's extracting data from itself. And I'll talk about how it extracts it later, I think. I can't remember if I put that in this talk or not. Um, launches itself and then immediately deletes the binary that it wrote to disk. So, that was neat. Um, so how do we extract the encrypted binary? Well, I was um, lazy, and I didn't want to figure out the code on how it actually extracts itself. So I kind of cheated. I m mentioned it deletes itself with uh, temp dstart, and if you remember from the strings, you see this um, call unlink. Um, unlink is delete, basically. Uh, unlink is the libc call that deletes a file okay on, on unix so what i just did is i went in the code that removes temp d start that does unlink temp d start and that there it is and i just return change that's a five that call unlink is five bytes of data i just um knopped it out which means i put a, a, a command that does nothing basically um a knop is a uh nothing and and um, a PC architecture, it's hex 90. I just put in five 90s, overwrote that unlink, and now I have nop, 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 and then continue. So it never deletes the file. Um, so then I just went in the system, copied out the file. I got the booty. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I went in the system and just copied the extracted binary. I didn't have to worry about decrypting it. Um, all that work they did to hide it in the file and decrypt it, I didn't have to even worry about. 
because I just knocked it out. But there's an even easier way. There's an even easier way without doing any reverse engineering or patching of the binary to get the extracted binary. And that's, again, that proc self exe. Because while this program is the extractor is running, proc self exe is this binary, the extraction tool. But the moment it spawns itself, um, execs itself, I'm not sorry, not spawns itself, um, execs itself and runs that temp destart, well, that becomes the binary. So if I didn't want to patch it, all I had to do was um, go let the game actually run through a virtual terminal or maybe SSH because it had SSH installed. You had to start it up manually. It's in user local, open SSH. Um, you could SBIN, SSHD. You could connect into the, the um, machine. Once it's running, you just find out the process, uh, temp destart, what the PID is, go to proc, the, the number of the PID, exe, and just copy that. Um, so you wouldn't even have to knock anything out. So again, it was really neat because they, they went to some effort to protect their um, code, to hide the actual binary, but their techniques were lacking, at least on Linux. Um, they didn't work too well. So, but that was fun, and I appreciated the, the, the challenge. Uh, so eventually I was less lazy and figured out how the decryption worked because I had nothing better to do at 1 a.m. on a Saturday night after watching Saturday Night Live. <clears throat> so here's how it works. The whole decryption process, that wrapper script, um, one of the child processes will, when it forks itself, which I mentioned it did, um, it will open Proxelf VXE, it will seek to a hard-coded offset in binary, it's uh, binary hex 8, I'm sorry, 187C. It reads one byte, verifies the byte is one, and then while there is data left to be read, it reads eight bytes, ignores the top four bytes, um, treats the low four bytes as an integer, a size, reads that many bytes, and then um, does an XOR with some data based on what, how many bytes into the, the read it is, um, and then writes the file to temp start. I'm not going to talk about the X. I don't actually really understand. I mean, I did understand the algorithm. I don't understand why they chose the algorithm they used. Um, but um, basically does a position-based XOR, writes the, the file to temp, temp destart. So that was pretty easy. Get root on the, the uh, yeah, get a root shell in the system, find out how the game starts up, obtain the binaries. And the final step, which is much more in depth, much more um, difficult, and, and again, interesting. They did some interesting things. Um, and I, I enjoyed the process of looking through what they did and, and figuring out how to defeat it. Um, so the next step, which we will talk about in part two of this series, is reverse engineer, patch the binary, defeat the security key. So in uh, this lesson, again, we talked about how to get root shell in the system. We talked about how the, the system um, hides the game binary, how it extracts the game binary. We've got the game binary, and we're going to, in the next um, lesson or talk or whatever, part of the series, we're going to reverse engineer it and, uh, and beat the security key. Thanks for watching.